net worth uh, rebounding considerably, and now we're at record levels there. Record levels on the S&P. <clears throat> the Fed balance sheet is also at a record level, which is not a positive, but it does speak to how much we've been pushing to uh, address the problem as, as quickly as we can, which is why I think a lot of people are kind of uh, a little off balance. When you look at money supply, that's up, I think, 27% for the U.S. last year. So another uh, thing really on the move. And then capital expenditures at record levels and continuing to be well above uh, the pre-pandemic levels and a very sharp rebound there. So those are all the positives and that's been playing out. <clears throat> the risks are, are ones that we were talking about in the, in the lead up to this, which is rising cases in Europe, Canada, and Brazil. And what's interesting is a lot of this is around the access uh, to the AstraZeneca uh, uh, treatment and vaccine. And that has actually created a problem. What I'll show you here is the um, orange line is the US coming down from its big spike. The uh, purple line in the middle that also had a spike was Turkey. I don't put a lot of stock in those numbers. Uh, but when you go into the green line down here, you can see that's Germany on the rise. Um, you also have uh, France uh, moving up quite a bit. Uh, Brazil as a big area of problems um, as well. Uh, so a lot of challenges around here. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the access to the vaccines. For all the criticism of Operation Warp Speed, it's really paid off for the U.S. Uh, across the two administrations. And, you know, we're really getting it, getting the vaccines out, which is helping us. Uh, but there are growing problems in, particularly in the uh, South America, um, parts of Europe uh, are continuing to be real issues. So um, this is going to create an unevenness in the recovery and really challenge some of the opportunities. And particularly for Europe, this recent rise in cases um, as we go into the warmer season, particularly for tourism, is going to challenge their tourism uh, uh, business, which is a big part of GDP. Another risk is rising yields. And this is not a big one for us, but um, you know we have moved up quite a bit off the lows. Uh, and we've moved up very sharply in, in the last uh, three months. Um, we don't expect it continue, to continue to move up quite as sharply, but we do think that um, you know, we can be in a slightly higher rate environment. This is a challenge for high multiple stocks um, and uh, it makes the, future va the value of future earnings uh, discounted to a, a, a different discount rate. Um, so that's gonna challenge particularly a lot of high valuation, uh, high multiple stocks. Um, and then we have another big one coming through and this is a, a chart going back to 1913 of the highest um, uh, tax bracket and the lowest tax bracket uh, for the different time periods going back to 1913 through today. We're now talking about potential tax increases that um, the estimates are all over, but for the top tax bracket could be taking us up into the 66% level. Um, one of the challenges with the federal tax increases is it's coming at the same time state and local governments are increasing taxes. So what's the total effect of the burden coming through? And ironically, on a corporate tax side, I believe Germany is actually lowering their corporate taxes, particularly for partnerships, which are in the 45% range and definitely need to come down. I think their corporations are at 30 and I think they wanna bring them all down there. So, you know, ironically, we're going the other way in the US. I think we probably went too low the last time and may overshoot this time, both on the individual and corporate tax level, but this is something that we're very mindful of. Other key risks are that inflation runs away from the central bankers, not our core case, but something we're monitoring. And really, I think one of the big risks right now is China's challenge to the you know, world order. Um, you're seeing it with sanctions against Australia, the EU, the US and Canada, the uh, China-India border clashes. Now China has a 25 year deal with Iran that is not gonna endear them to the US and uh, that's going to create even even greater strains. So there's real issues going back and forth and that doesn't get into the South China Sea issues and <laughs> threats about uh, taking action against Taiwan and Hong Kong and how that plays out. But 
you know, this is a real challenge when you have two of the world's leading economies or three, if you factor in all of Europe, um, really at odds with each other. And that has to have a hangover effect on the uh, global economy <clears throat> and makes you need to be much more specific about where you're investing. Well, I think there are good opportunities in the emerging market area. I think there's uh, uh, significant vulnerabilities there, particularly as you go from country to country. So you have some countries with very high debt levels. Um, the dollar recovery is going to put even further strains on their debts and um, as well as their debt servicing costs. So we think that uh, that's another issue. And they are running at multiple speeds. So um, you really have to be very selective about where you're investing in these areas. And as I said, the health issues in, are growing in terms of Brazil and other nations. I think a big concern for corporations is the uh, a complete reversal of the easing of regulatory burdens from the Trump administration uh, to much greater burdens on U.S. corporations. Uh, hard to uh, tell, but the cost on the economy can be quite high from excessive regulation. I think the other issue, and we're, we saw it this week with the blow up of the hedge fund, the family office in uh, Asia, is there has been a buildup of leverage in the system and you know leverage left unchecked is always a big issue. And I think maybe the most important risk that's out there today is we're in a new phase of globalization. And what we talked about earlier with China is part of that, but the first phase of globalization for the US was offshoring. And the impacts of offshoring were pretty significant. And uh, it basically led to lower investment in the US because you were going to not be upgrading manufacturing plants if you were shipping them overseas. It created worker issues. It created challenges in terms of the carving out of the middle class. All that occurred as we were seeing this uh, shift from US manufacturing to overseas. I think the manufacturing sector lost somewhere along the lines of uh, 11 million employees during that period. Now we talked about last week, the digital economy has picked up 8.8 .8 of that, but now we're in a new phase where we're bringing back uh, both onshoring of business with Taiwan Semi as an example of that, or Samsung bringing uh, chip manufacturing plants to Texas and Arizona. Um, at the same time, you have reshoring coming back, which is really gonna help build up the manufacturing area, particularly in the middle of the United States. Um, that leads to more investment. More investment leads to increased spending towards uh, productivity improvements, which lowers costs and make, make us more competitive. So I think these are the risks that are out there. Um, and I'll give you the ARS take on it. Um, we remain focused on these critical transformations that are occurring and think that the trains left the station from a digital transformation, from a political and social one, from a monetary and fiscal one, um, so we continue to favor uh, equity investments. Um, we're avoiding the highest and lowest valuation stocks in the, in the public markets. We're focused on companies with embedded advantages that will allow them to continue to invest and to continue to widen their competitive moat. Um, we believe that earnings will matter much more in 2021. So you wanna get the companies that have strong earnings characteristics and uh, rather than relying on multiple expansion, the move up in rates makes multiple expansion much more difficult and isolating earnings is going to be the key for, for people. We think the market's broadening out and that's fine. The slight pullback that we've had in some of the things, uh, the first part of this year should be normal and expected after the strong year that they've had. But it is a broadening out of the economy that we're gonna see as the economy reopens. So small caps continue to do quite well. And we would just advise people to be highly selective with the rest of the world. We favor China, but there's some challenges in how China's dealing with uh, their tech sector as well. So uh, something to keep an eye on there. We like private equity, private credit and venture. We think they are good opportunities, but as same with the public markets, you have to be careful of valuations and growth expectations. Um, when you're working off of all of what the revenue growth is gonna be and their market positioning, you're making bigger bets in our view. So you have to really be careful about that. We've, we're seeing inflation rising. So that's not a, uh, an issue that re, in our view can be debated. The question is, does it, how fast does it rise and is it going to be transitory or not? We remain in the transitory camp. 
Um, we do think the Fed's going to be a little bit surprised uh, how fast they may have to shift. But we do think that um, the more spending we make and the more onshoring we do, the more it increases productivity. And productivity is the antidote to inflation. So over a reasonable time, we don't see that being an issue. Uh, and our key themes remain the digital transformation, which we believe is underappreciated. And I was just seeing some statistics, 80% um, of corporations surveyed by ISI Evercore are going to be increasing their tech spend this year. 88% of them are going to be increasing their uh, shift to the cloud. Um, we think that what we've seen over the last year is just an acceleration that uh, continues to be underappreciated because we haven't seen the best benefits as the guys on the 5G panel talked about of 5G and artificial intelligence and the like, that's all on the come. We think that 5G is going to enable not only new transformative technologies, but create massive new total addressable markets. And that's going to help offset the transition from old economy to new economy. But our government's going to have to step in and uh, infrastructure spend is going to have to go up. I read today that the Biden administration is talking about <clears throat> now a $4 trillion infrastructure plan with $3 trillion of tax increases. Um, I'm not sure that that's going to be a positive solution for the long term to deal with it that way. Uh, but part of their infrastructure uh, plan is to help with uh, skills as industries have been carved out here. We like the innovation in healthcare as we believe that's going to continue to accelerate. And you saw that with the uh, uh, Pfizer's partner, uh, Binex, who is now looking to uh, move their RNA technology over to cancer treatments. And we just think that uh, the future is going to be very bright for healthcare innovation. We remain very focused on cyber with uh, the shift to drone space, um, cyber and advanced weaponry in the security area. We've, we've increased our exposure to financials and, and into industrials, including transportation. Uh, and we like the financial area. But I would say across all markets, um, it's a time to be uh, very cautious and very thoughtful about the uh, quality of the investments that you're making right now. The uh, challenging money is ahead of us. The easy money, I think, is behind us. So, Mark, with that, we'll stop and open it up for discussion. Thanks, Stephen. Questions, comments? Um, I'll, 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 I'll jump in there. See, we, you know, we were talking a little bit in, in the, the prelim um, about kind of the disarray in Europe. And I know that the expectation was that Europe was going to, you know, recover and, and probably do well. But, it, but if, if, they, if they are delayed in all that, it seems as though that there could be, you know, pressure on the euro, perhaps the U.S. dollar continuing to strengthen, and if interest rates here continue, you know, or at least stabilize, stabilize or, or, or even edge up a little bit more, that, that USD is, is going to be attractive. Does, you know, does that, A, does that make sense? You know, yeah, B, I, I, it doesn't bode very well for Europe. No, I, I, I actually really worry about Europe because they've already had strains prior to the pandemic between the North and the South, the handling of the pandemic has created bigger strains in, in each country's governments, in many countries' governments, and also further the strains between the North and the South. And when you have a tourist-driven economy uh, and you can't let people in, that's a problem that's not gonna get better anytime soon. Um, so I do think you're right on the dollar. I think the areas are, I think it's a really a two horse race between the US and China. Um, for where you want to invest and where you see the biggest opportunities in the near term. I wouldn't write off Europe uh, wholesale, but um, there is some really great innovative uh, innovation going on in France and other areas um, in Europe. But I, I think it's really going to be a challenge, uh, are really going to be a challenge for Europe to get their act together against that backdrop that you just described, Bill. And I do think the dollar continues to strengthen. Um, in a way that's going to be uh, a challenge for 
uh, some of the emerging market economies and for Europe. So, love to hear from the European view on that. Hey, Stephen, I have a question on the uh, U.S. corporate tax rate. <clears throat> I think you talked about, obviously, you know, Biden's pushing to get it up to 28%. No way. That, that'll never happen, right? The question is, you know, from an, an economic and investment point of view, what, what's an acceptable kind of increase on that corporate tax rate? What do you go from 21 to 24, 25? I, ex I would expect they go to 20, 20, I think 25 would be reasonable. Um, you know, we forget that it was 35 before it was, you know, brought down. So right. our corporations could handle higher taxes. The problem is um, the big corporations aren't paying anywhere near that. It's the small businesses that get are really, our tax code is missing. You know, if you're a partnership or, a, you know, a self-employed guy, you're, you're not getting taxed at the right rates. Um, they're not doing, the tax code's wrong for what we need. But I think we can handle a 25% uh, corporate tax rate um, pretty easily uh, in the U.S. I don't think that's the be only end all. I think the bigger issue is how do we collect the taxes that we're owed? And, uh, the, you know, there's been some really good articles around that and what the government could do if they were able to more effectively collect taxes, um, including just having, the, you know, this minimum tax that they're talking about putting on as a global uh, global standard is going to be interesting to see how that uh, works through. But I think people forget we're going to have a massive jump in corporate earnings uh, year over year because of how much earnings were pulled down last year. So in the near term, from a market perspective, I don't think the tax changes are going to be that devastating. I think over the long term, though, you can't tax your way to dealing with our problems. You have to get some fiscal discipline on the spending and you have to get the spending that you're making to be much more productive. Other questions? Uh, I got a question for you. Um, relative to, uh, you know, you're saying it's the U.S. and it's China, and then relative to this um, hedge fund margin call that took place, um, do you think that creates opportunities for those for specific companies there? I mean. Those a couple, some of these things were large market cap companies, right? I mean, it's, you know, we've seen margin calls on smaller market cap types of assets or maybe in the treasury market, but just in the share price of these behemoths, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, well, there's those, the tech companies, the big tech companies in China had some other headwinds. Exactly. Going, going against them, but... You know, they're, a monop they're monopolies the, of the scale that are really, you know, quite impressive in what their capabilities are. And they're, they're excellent companies. They've been well run uh, on their, as um, entrepreneurial companies. Um, I do think it, that pullback creates some opportunities. I think it also creates some challenges. Uh, having worked for two big banks, um, I think there's going to be some real challenges for the banking industry coming out of this, particularly some of the, the ones that were really involved with this. That what were their risk management people thinking? Um, and how did they let this blow by them? Um, but I think the pullback we've seen in big tech here and in China is all part of a normal, healthy kind of easing of, uh, you know, they, they don't go straight up. And I think this is the normal Part of the process. I still think the big tech companies in Europe, in the U.S. and uh, China are going to continue to grow because they have the embedded advantages that we would look for. Their ability to spend is unlike anything else. And when they do acquisitions, they can bring in, you know, 100 to 800 million dollar uh, technologies and put them into their system, and they can ramp it up and create things that other people can't. Um, you saw that with Facebook, with Instagram and, you know, uh, WhatsApp They're They've realized the value from those deals that everyone thought were stretched. And I think that's what companies with embedded advantages can do. So Duncan, that's a long way of saying, I, I think there are opportunities. I think big tech is an area you're going to want to continue to be involved in and take advantage of pullbacks when you get them. Um, I do think there are big questions to be raised for the banking industry and how they were doing their risk on on these guys, particularly for the companies that are 
they they seem like they've been let off pretty easily here. I'm kind of amazed. Well, I think we've lowered the bar for them over the over the last 15 years to what our expectations are. But that, <laughs> there's going to be heads are going to roll on these on these. They're massive losses for banks that they shouldn't be having. So. Uh, Mark Jack Wyatt as for some companies. Yeah, I saw that. Teams. Um, so is that an offline thing or you want to talk about it? Uh, well, I have Sean on the call so he can help me out with this. Um, so, uh, for, uh, industrials, we like, uh, uh, Parker Hanavan. Um, we like, uh, a good Ohio company, right? Joe Jerebeck. Always. Oh, he's trying to appeal to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, we don't have anything for the Michigan guys right now that I'm aware of. We have General Motors, so uh, on the EV side. But uh, Sean, what were the other ones? Uh, uh, yeah. Hammond Armstrong for the infrastructure play. Yeah, we've got a logistics with XPO. Um, the rest. We also have, we've, you know, in the material space with Cliffs. Um, yeah, Ohio sorry. again. Sorry. Am I on mute? No. Nope. I was just saying Ohio again. Oh, <laughs> apologies. Um, so in the industrial space, I think that kind of... Raytheon in the, for the defense. Yeah. Um, and the rails. Uh, UNP. Yeah. So those are a couple areas. In the, in the cyber area, it's... Uh, Tufin and Intrusion, which have both pulled back, uh, as many of the cyber names have pulled back lately. So uh, we like them even more uh, based on the pullback. Uh, financials, we like uh, JP Morgan because of you want to go for quality in this environment, in our view there. Um, we also like BlackRock and Blackstone um, on the recovery uh, as well. What else, Sean, on the other themes that we were talking about? Uh, Tech, we continue to like the chip names. Um, and uh, that's another area we continue to feel strongly about. Uh, Micron being one of the big names there. We also like the uh, uh, capital equipment companies as you're creating the new fabs. Um, so those are uh, some of the ones. Charter Communications and Lilac for the uh, 5G uh, issues as well. So. Uh, I think that gives you, uh, and in healthcare, Biohaven and Ascendus, both of which have come in a little bit lately, which we're, uh, we're excited about. Biohaven does um, Nurtech, which is a breakthrough technology for migraines, and Ascendus does time release of uh, drugs so that if you have uh, like children who are going through human growth hormone treatments, usually get daily injections for three years. Um, uh, what this treatment does through Ascendus is it time releases with the same efficacy, so you can do one injection a week. So from a quality of life and from a, a cost and materials and all that, it's a much better way to go. So some really interesting opportunities that we think exist out there. So, so just I'm mindful of, of, of time. I wanted to introduce uh, another aspect of, I guess, by request or reintroducing is along with the macro to go have some ma micro contributions from the community. So this is a lot of words on the page, but um, I asked Zach Nasser to quickly comment just on what we're doing with, with impact. I asked, speak of Ohio, uh, Joe Jarabek, uh, real quick. We're gonna try to make these like just one minute around the houses. Simon Vine wears lots of hats. So quick recap on 5G and what he's got planned for, for SPAC. So, um, Simon, you came on first. You want to just do, do a two-parter, uh, 5G recap, and uh, what you're what yes. in the hello, space. hello, everyone. So thank you very much, Mark. So the first thing is that we had, I think, a very successful 5G session. Uh, at least I judge it by the feedback which I received. People learned a lot. It was the right, um, the right uh, combination of knowledge for our audience um, and uh, it was practical and I'm very grateful to Nitin uh, for actually providing us 
with a very in-depth and very fast analysis um, of the situation. So hopefully we will continue and the next uh, time we'll talk about specific um, technologies in which we can invest. Uh, and I will be looking for help to find uh, access to, uh, to different accelerators like uh, the one which we had with uh, Telefonico and I'm working on that one. If you know anyone, please let me know. The second thing is the SPACs. The theme is uh, very hot. Everybody wants to do SPACs nowadays. Um, Mark and I thought that it would be interesting to all, again, to the, to the audience, to learn the basics of this as opposed to the things which everybody talks about, that uh, there's money there and you can buy it on the cheap and stuff like that. So uh, we will be running a panel, uh, I ho hopefully next week, but if not, uh, maybe in a week. Uh, those who already agreed uh, to join us is uh, a managing director of Credit Suisse, uh, a gentleman who um, runs an ETF platform and one of the ETFs is SPAC ETF and um, it invested in 80 SPACs. So I need two, three speakers to confirm and um, we'll be good to go even uh, next Tuesday. But I'm not sure, I'm still chasing them. Thank you very much, Mark. Well, thanks, Simon. We'll, we'll talk later today. Yeah, thank you. We've, we've done events with 48 hour turnaround, but we'll see. Um, how about on impact, Zach? Uh, hi, you Mark. were here. Um, yes, I'm, I'm here. You're uh, awfully so quiet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want to go later? It's time for an overview on impact. You're, you're muffled. You want to... Let's let you go later. Joe, Joe Jerebeck, you actually, I need to invest in a new audio for you, but go ahead. Thanks, Mark. Well, that, that just came up briefly in yesterday's calls. Uh, but no, we're looking to do an Ohio event, uh, a live in person sometime September, October, uh, with a hybrid component to that as well. I'm hoping that we can get Stephen Burke back to Ohio. I know the Lieutenant Governor is a very big fan of Stephen and is looking to have a co keynote with Stephen again. That was mentioned and discussed with the Lieutenant Governor just a couple of days ago. Okay. Uh, Doing something new here, and I think this is something that's very fascinating for the platform and, and those in this community. Is we're blending government uh, with the platform for this event. We have full cooperation from the administration, multiple state agencies that are all looking to roll out the red carpet and, and highlight many things that are going on here in Ohio in, in ways that you can also enrich your portfolios. So with that, we're, we're excited for the event, and I know it's. Uh, as we move closer to it, Mark will be talking more about the events, but we are currently looking at September, October for doing a live event here in Ohio and uh, blowing the doors off of it. Yeah, basically we've got all the, the, the pension funds are lining up, uh, all the, the, the funds, the family offices, like Ohio is really coming together. This will be a first, first and unique thing. It's a little bit akin to what Texas does with emerging managers, but you know, with family offices and then with the full state support. And Joe has been a great uh, rallier, uh, which m makes me want to show you guys. My Michigan people won't be happy, um, but I have a an Easter thing to show you guys later. But uh, uh, are you back on, Zach? Can we, you want to? Uh, yes, yes, you? I can speak, I think, better now. Yep, go for it. Um, cool. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, I think the impact event uh, went well. Like we had a lot of uh, great speakers. Uh, towards the end, though, I felt maybe we had too many speakers for the time. Like some uh, had to be rushed on a bit. So maybe for next time, we'd consider, you know, having uh, sub events as well related to certain themes, right? Sort of like the breakouts, um, but uh, so that the speakers could actually present more. Um, I think the debates, the main debates were about, you know, systems level thinking in terms of, you know, uh, what system we should deploy, how capitalism could be, you know, more empathetic or not. A uh, big uh, topic was obviously renewable energy that could be uh, profitable on its own, uh, which isn't, I guess, a 
theme mentioned here before. Um, we we showed more philanthropies this time, I think, than than usual. Um, so two or three by my count. Uh, I think there is a lot of appetite for venture within Impact. If you recall, the, the breakout room had the most number of people. Um, so maybe based on that, we could have uh, maybe more startups to showcase, like Impact startups doing new things. Maybe people would be interested in uh, sort of like a showcase type thing. Mm -hmm. um, um, that's like sort of like an insight from that. Um, what else? Uh, and obviously, uh, measurement was another important important topic, right? Like, uh, uh, what sort of like checklist to use uh, and metrics uh, for measuring impact itself. Um, and we saw certain people are sophisticated with that; some aren't. And then I don't know, Jonathan, Dana. Thanks. Thanks. Point, points. Points noted. Jonathan, do you want to share something this week or? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to on, on the VC space. Um, I mean, we, we've been active in the VC space this whole year. Um, I mean, I can tell you at high level, a couple of things that's interesting. This isn't new, but almost no funds anymore, especially in VC are charging um, points or markups on any capital. So whether you invest in day one of the first close or two years later at the end of a harvest period or investment period, all these funds are allowing you to come in without marks with just the de minimis interest expense. I will say most of the momentum and the fundraisers I'm seeing on the early side of it, ed tech, anything tied to Biden's infrastructure, especially on energy tech or anything to improve the grid is huge oversubscribed blockchain, any type of migration of blockchain plus fintech all massively are subscribed on these funds. The later stage VC, um, I'm not seeing a, a ton of interest from my families there and even the capital raises that are coming out other than the established players in that side of it. You're just not seeing a lot of momentum there, at least from my standpoint. So continue basically to focus on the early, uh, early side of it, especially blockchain, which again, the thesis being blockchain plus fintech are going to merge. And so if you can still get into these companies at attractive valuations right now, it will pay off in the end. Can I ask a question, Jonathan, are you getting involved in NFTs at all? So NFTs, um, on the personal side, I've dabbled with it just to understand it better. But in terms of actual investing, we're not getting involved directly in NFTs. We're getting involved more in the back end of it. So companies like Dapper, who built the infrastructure for NBA Top Shop, Top Shot, that's who we would get interested in. But we're not trying to make bets on buying them and holding those assets for appreciation. Got you, because I, uh, I know a platform that's trying to build on a technology called Adara Hashgraph which is a uh, blockchain, but much, much faster. It can do, I think like around 80,000 transactions per second with 0 0.0001 gas fees at this point. Um, the deal is too early for me for what our fund is looking at, but I may be able to forward it to you. Yeah, I'd love to take a look. You do see, it's interesting from the platform side of it, you definitely have people that are looking to um, en enhance the protocol. I would say, I mean, Obviously, Bitcoin is more the store of value. Most things right now are Ethereum-based for the platform. Again, that has its issues. Um, I'd love to see that. I'll give you, I mean, one example of more of a direct company investing in the infrastructure side of it, things like Fireblocks, which create the, um, which create the tunnel for contracts. Or That's a really interesting type of um, idea or things that we're interested in, too. And the, and the only other question I have is, are you, are you looking at... Um, other networks outside of Ethereum because proof of stake is not going to be ready ideally until next year. Um, we are, I mean, we're not, we're not making bets on the networks. I leave that to more uh, technologically savant people. I'd say the thing that I keep hearing a lot about is Solana versus Ethereum. But again, I'm not taking a bet there one way or the other. I let the, um, the blockchain companies themselves do that. Right. The only one I'd say to watch out for, because I know investors are going to be seeing a lot of it, is um, they were called Matic. They've been rebranded as, I believe, Polychain. Uh, oh, China they, Polychain Capital. Yeah. They, they, they have great technology, but they're out of India. And I think they'll have a lot of political issues. Um, I, th I think, uh, and also if Ethereum does their own version of proof of stake and they don't use their layer two, that value may be not worth much. Uh, it's good to know. I know, um, as you said, India, there's definitely a lot of uncertainty there. Thanks, Jonathan. And 
Jonah. Mark, if I could just add, if people aren't yeah. following Jonathan on LinkedIn, uh, they might want to. He has great uh, uh, updates he puts on there that always has some unique angle on uh, the markets or what's going on in the economy. So, uh, Jonathan, I appreciate what you're doing on your LinkedIn pages. Uh, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Good stuff. Anyone else? So as you guys are talking about deals, just a, just a reminder, it's, you know, Charles Way was talking about a couple of deals. It's pretty easy, just, you know, at least on a no-name basis, I can get, uh, we, we're, we're taking inventory. This is, these are the project names. So if you're interested in FinTech, um, this is like a, there's a, you know, the public markets, if no, this is like a, it's like a, uh, uh, to play on ex uh, foreign exchange rates, um, but a lot of interesting things that, that are not even on here yet. You can go to this part of the pipeline, and if something interests you, then I can curate an introduction as suitable. This is sort of my interim step of uh, helping people connect, and uh, you know, we, we're going to continue to update these. Chris White, are you still on? I saw he's he's leading an IPO here in uh, in Brazil, which is an interesting one. Hey, Mark, this is key. Um, love to to jump in. I I know um, it sounds like you're you're putting together a, a panel on uh, SPACs, which I think will be high interest. I'm you know curious to hear from you know Stephen or others. You know how it's moving around. You know some of the small cap you know, market views and, you know, from a venture perspective, uh, you know, how it's, you know, uh, shifting or changing any, you know, allocation plans or thinking from the, you know, sort of family office side of things. Steve, I guess that's to you. Uh, we, we, we look at them as we look at all small cap companies when they come out, although some of them aren't small cap uh, when they're when they're out. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually starting to look at the ones that came out last year to see, uh, based on the pullbacks, are their valuations now more appropriate for where we would look to uh, enter? But I think there's going to be some interesting opportunities, given the volatility that we've had on some of the SPACs that came out last year to maybe take uh, some shots on, but we do look at them. We do use them in our small cap strategies and also in uh, the Papyrus Fund. Steve, we had, and as you know, we've, we did uh, in the Fortress uh, value acquisition SPAC that became uh, MP materials. Yep. Uh, we were an investor uh, early there and continue to hold it. It's interesting because it's, it's part of what's reverse. You know, we've had a, you know, a 20 year to 15 year decline in the number of publicly listed stocks in the US. The Wilshire 5000 at its peak was I think around 7,400 companies. And today it's 3,750 or something like that. So uh, we've had a, you know, the public markets have been cut in half of listed stocks and the SPACs are actually starting to create some uh, new opportunities, which is uh, very helpful as well to get the listings back up. So we're, we think they're interesting, but you know, you have to invest as carefully in that as you do anything else. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm looking at it more from the venture side, but I'm, I'm very, you know, keen on the, the, you know, shift that it has from a market infrastructure perspective. Um, I think, you know, some of them are moving fast and, and furious, but, um, you know, it's part of a uh, evolution. If you look, you know, go back 10 years, you'll see, you know, crowdfunding, Reg A plus, direct listing. Now you've got, you know, sort of a rena renaissance in, in the SPAC to, to replace the small cap IPO. You know, so there's a, it's an innovative tool. Um, it, it, it has some advantages. It probably also has some marketplace disadvantages that I think, you know, are being investigated and, you know, thought through. I worry a little bit about the, you know, sort of analyst support and the institutional support for, you know, 700, you know, newly de-spacked companies, which is what we're going to have soon here. And, um, you know, that creates opportunity, um, you know, as much as it creates volatility. Yeah, I agree with that. I think the, uh, I, 
you know, you're getting a lot thrown at, at the market and uh, mm -hmm. it's a it's a different format that it's going to take some time for Wall Street to analyze them the right way to produce, I think, the type of research that is going to be useful. Good point. And hey, Mark, can I throw out a quick, uh, yeah. a quick topic of mine? And I don't have an answer, but I'm curious, maybe Stephen or anyone else who has been able to dig into this. Obviously, what's been happening with Viacom, Viacom CBS, we know that institutional leverage is whatever having ripple effects. Does anyone have any good hey. ways of digging into basically gray market leverage? Hey, you, you can compare NAVs yeah. versus regulatory AUM, but I'm just curious if anyone's ever tried to dig into it more holistically to see where those risk landmines lie. No help from here. Yeah, Where's it coming from? I mean, this is not, not the traditional bank leverage. It's, I mean, traditional, I'd say it's always been there. I mean, using the you know, swap agreements, using, you know, off the market um, derivative, well, all swap agreements, basically. It's just, I think now you're seeing leverage once again, step up to levels where most people don't realize it. So you do all this fundamental work, you can buy a great company and then have your investment go down 60% because a hedge fund went 12 times levered on it and got a margin call. Jonathan, the one thing I did read on this uh, this case in particular uh, as it relates to Viacom was when all the risk teams at the different banks did their analysis on uh, on the leverage, they only looked at it as, shockingly, they only looked at it as if they had a problem, not if everyone had a problem at the same time. Yep. Uh, so their, their analysis was just not good. Uh, yeah. so. Um, and we've done that before, you know, and I, when I worked at Deutsche Bank in 05, my boss was on the executive management committee and he came back from one of their conferences and he said, uh, sell all your stock. I was like, why? He goes, we don't work for a bank. We work for the world's largest hedge fund. And at that point, Deutsche was levered, you know, around 40 to one. And they weren't sure all, all the different sides of the tranches of the credit default swaps they're on what they really added up to is what it came down to. So it's not surprising that they're gonna miss some of these things, but um, this one's gonna be a tough one uh, for the banks. Yeah, I agree. I did see, but I don't think it's made into the pipeline. There's a there is a new private credit player trying to provide the same kind of, that kind of credit to family office. Anybody who's, that would be under 25 million trading. So I'll find that that sheds any light, but I don't think it made it onto here. But this is the public side of what you can see. So you can see we have a lot of early VC, some PEP, a lot of PE growth, some pre-IPOs, private credit, public, some real estate, secondaries, VC growth, VC early. So that's good. And this, uh, by the way, this this slide is, we have a lot of data this week. So if you're interested in, you know, electric vehicles, health tech, which took a spike, ag tech, ed tech, um, obviously the 5G slides, and you can see, you can get more information if you, if you ask for it. Um, there's a whole cannabis market study coming together, et cetera. And then... 40 new users added. And if I, I think I showed everybody. If anybody wants to, oh, there's my Easter, my Michigan people. You can, uh, I was, I grew up in Ohio, all right? Okay. Um, but the mentoring is another thing that we're doing. If you want to be a mentor, we because we have so many people adding, we're just looking for people that can help us do 10, 50 minute calls with new members. So if you're interested, just let me know. Uh, coming up on top of the hour. Any other comments, questions? Hey, Calm. Um, oh, Britt. Just yeah, Britt, introduce my... yourself, please. Hi, my name's Brittany. Um, I just got into contact with the 361 just recently through uh, someone else I was trying to, well, I was thinking about investing with. They, um, introduced me to this firm yep. um 
Welcome. So about the Viacom, I noticed a lot of people um, like buy the anticipation and sell on the news. So I'm not sure if it's related to this, but Viacom seems to be doing pretty well. I think they have that Paramount partnership and new deals and stuff. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be super successful, but with the uh, um, streaming, it probably will have some good success. It's The stock's been going up. So I think it's like people want to sell on news and it seems like it did okay. Um, so like the people who uh, liked it, I mean, if it went up a lot, uh, I mean, if uh, the news was good, it probably would have gone up a lot. But I feel like because it was in the middle, the people who sell the news like outnumbered the people who would buy the news. So I think that's kind of why it went down. But companies aren't going to tell you when they're selling. They just sell. And then afterwards, it makes the news. So that's my opinion on it. So Brittany Bunk, is that new, new to our community? Welcome. Thanks. Anyone else? Erica, Kevin, Charles, Paul, Dave Kroom, Darren, Roger. Dave Kroom, yeah, real quick on 5G. I, I did provide some, a link in the last summit. Um, have my buddy out at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. He runs an innovation studio in conjunction with Verizon. So if anybody's aware of more disruptive technology to experiment that lab is available and i can make a introduction that was verizon yeah we we're supposed to have a verizon 5g labs third person on our panel i'll find it for you but uh, the big component is besides just converting technology that's useful in 5g it's also uh, cybersecurity is a big big component that's a lot of the study that's done in the lab there with the doe maybe that would be useful yeah. for you uh Phil Deutscher. mark this is sarah can i share something yes just because I, I did find it this is the person uh dave um christian granalva from 5g labs if uh well we but you can maybe we can we can tie this back into cybersecurity as well Okay, Sarah? Yeah, I just wanted to invite um, everyone to get in touch with me if you have a fundraiser that you want to use the movie for. If you have a philanthropy, an interest, um, we're doing fundraisers like we did with 360 One Firm with um, In Search of Greatness. And that features Ken Robinson, and it talks about creativity, innovation, and it's great for, uh, like I said, school sports, youth sports teams, and it's being used in the corporate world for pushing creativity and innovation. So I welcome anyone to get in touch with me for uh, a screening and a facilitated discussion for fundraising for youth sports, schools, or your philanthropy, or at your business site. Great. Well, there's a great team around that uh, whole project, and I would definitely endorse that. Maxime, anyone else before we break? All right. Well, if you if anybody's interested in, in uh, anything we've we've talked about, you always reach out. This is uh we have uh, if we don't speak, you know, happy Easter to everyone. Uh, and um, and then I guess Simon's off, but we have a lot of if, if anybody wants to particularly get involved with this back event, that uh, that's key. And then I'll be in touch with everybody with some special guests coming this week. So I'll, I'll uh, Easter. yes, happy Easter, Bill.
I could flash my, I don't know how old I was. My, uh, I thought the Easter Bunny existed. It doesn't. No, I, I don't want to ruin it for anyone. Mark, are we painting Christmas or uh, Easter eggs later this week? Um, I married Jewish, so uh, it's a sensitive subject sometimes, but we'll see. Yeah, happy Passover too, right? Yeah, that was good. I might get filled with it. But uh, yeah, be in touch, everybody. Have a great day. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay. Thank you.